So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the Hartford Art School open house breakout session. I'm Rebecca Lee. I am assistant director of admission for Hartford Art School. And with us today are our amazing admission coordinators. We have Roxy Ryan and Ashley Berube. We also have with us professor in printmaking, Tatiana Potts, who will be giving us a live studio demonstration and professor in art history, Z Onuf, who will be presenting on the importance of our art history program. We will have time for questions and answers at the end. So please utilize the Q and A function in the Zoom. You know, you can enter in questions at any time and we'll make sure to answer all of those for you either during or after the presentations. Um, so we'll start with a short video. There's a deep desire in us to make pictures. I mean, they've been drawing for 30,000 years. The teaching of drawing is teaching people to look. That's what it's doing. It was really when I was at art school that I started to see the relationship between history, philosophy, politics, and art. Prior to that, I, I thought that art was just making pretty pictures. Actually, art is connected to, you know, life. You can't teach art in the same way you can teach French. French exists whether, whether you do it or not. But when you're doing art, the center of doing art is in yourself. Most of the literate subjects do not ask that of them. So this develops an entirely different realm of skill. Creativity is critical thinking. And without it, how are you going to really open up and ask harder questions? And art opens all of those kind of passages and possibilities to think beyond what we already know. In a child's education, that doors need to be open to other universes, other modes of thinking. And art is a non-pre-described, dangerous world full of possibility. And I think it's a vital space for children to have in the formative years of their education. From a top-down level, you don't have innovation if you don't have arts. It's as simple as that. It doesn't matter if you're going to study history or geography or science, you still need to be creative. Because the people who are the outliers in those fields are the most creative people. To have art in schools be eroded, which is happening at the moment, is disastrous for Britain, I think, because our best industry is the creative industry. Art and cultural production is at the very centre of what makes a society what it is. And for an entire new generation not to know what is the cultural and visual history of ourselves is kind of denying our own identity. Art is a reflection of the society that we are. The kind of mirror that art holds up, the way that art helps define the identity of a nation, that you can trace that back historically. It's deeply embedded in humanity. What art education does to people who are not going to be artists is giving them the opportunity to build certain aspects of themselves that otherwise will be either ignored, undeveloped, or repressed. It's all about kids finding out who they are, and they're all different. That you can be whatever you want to be is something that art has only taught me. It can access a part of your brain, body, spirit, mind, that nothing else can. Nothing is more stimulating, exciting, consoling than looking at a brilliant painting. Art in schools shouldn't be sidelined. I think it should be right there, right up in the front, because I think art teaches you to deal with the world around you. It's the oxygen that actually makes all the other subjects breathe. There's a great quote by John Ruskin. Art shows us what it is to be human. And really, that's, that's why art should be on the curriculum.
Awesome, love that video. So I'm going to be doing a quick introduction on introducing artists in today's world and some highlights um, of Hartford Art School. That video in this article is from the Tate Art Museum in London. The importance of art education is a global standard. Art is an important part of every aspect of our lives. Everything we do stems from creative learning at a young age. Outside of the tangibility of art as a career, practicing art is, an important, to, is important to experience the world around us. Art changes how we see the world. It's really as simple as that. Art allows us opportunities to see everything around us from a different perspective. It's a language that we can create, teach others, and learn from. In 1985, a group of female artists founded the Guerrilla Girls. They dubbed themselves the conscience of the art world. They started making posters that bluntly stated facts of discrimination and used humor to convey information, provoke discussion, and to show that feminists could be funny. They assumed the names of dead women artists and began wearing gorilla masks when appearing in public to conceal their true identities in order to focus on the issues at hand. They, they did this through the use of provocative text, visuals, and humor in the service of feminism and social change. Artist Robert Rauschenberg created global programs emphasizing the importance of freedom of creative expression and human rights. He traveled to countries around the world, often where artistic experimentation was suppressed, creating collaborative art exhibitions in those places. The purpose was to spark a dialogue and achieve a mutual understanding through the creative process. Our world is experiencing difficult times to say the very least, and art has never been more important as something to rely on as an outlet, a resource, and a way to bring people together. So in times of crisis, we need humanity, expression, and the community that the arts create. Throughout the rest of the day and through the rest of this presentation, I want you to look around you and notice how much of your daily life incorporates art and design. It will be a lot more than you might assume. The visual language of art is such a huge part of how we live every day. Art is a part of everything we encounter on a daily basis, from video games that we play, every single app on your phone to fashion design and everything in between. All of these things are designed by a team of artists and creatives. Think of all the spaces that we walk through and live in from a hotel lobby, the inside of your car, the chair or the couch that you're sitting on right now to even fictional spaces like Barbie's dream house are all designed by artists. We all know that da Vinci is famous for creating the Mona Lisa, but he is also widely known for his inventive drawings for flying machines, which much later led to the creation of the helicopter. So art as innovation. From the history of photography in the early 1840s, we are seeing the world for the very first time and in the shortest amount of time than any other medium, where photography is today, we can photograph into outer space. Penn State facilitated a project that brought ceramic artists and engineers together to make ceramic water filters for area that didn't have access to clean drinking water. So there's really no limit to what the arts can create and impact. And there is a ton of research out there. This is just one example showcasing the importance of arts in one way. And here's a list of many articles that just our office has found. So there's really a lot of research out there to be done on these topics. So a little bit about Hartford Art School. 
The University of Hartford is made up of seven colleges that all share one campus together. Hartford Art School is the top right picture, the yellow building. The university is made up of about 4,500 students. The art school makes up about 310 of those. There are 100 undergraduate majors on campus, including nine in the art school, which allows for really unlimited possibilities to take classes, minor and double major in any area you're interested in across campus. So it's a pretty unique situation. All students enter into the art school as undecided art majors and go through our foundations year, which is your first year where students take an intro level course in observational drawing, design, 3D, time-based works, and a lecture class called Issues in Art Making before declaring your major in sophomore year. One of the great benefits of being a professional art school that shares a university is the opportunity to study abroad. There's many, many amazing places and things that you can study while abroad. These are students from the art school that were in Cortona, Italy last year. We facilitate a number of amazing internships and visiting artist programs for all of our majors. One featured here in the center and two right images is our annual Art Basel Miami internship where students go to Miami for this giant international art fair and work with the Bass Museum of Art. We have two galleries on campus, Silpi and Josilov. Both show a mix of student, faculty, and visiting artists work from around the world. So it's a really great resource for students to practice showing their own artwork in a professional gallery while also being able to see what other artists are working on. And to apply, you can apply through the Common App or through our website, whatever is easiest for you. We are on a rolling admission basis. Test scores are optional and your portfolio review is required for admission. So your portfolio, these are our requirements. You could submit your portfolio for us to review through Slide Room. Um, we're also setting up virtual review appointments by email or through our website. And full tuition scholarship is a great opportunity for all incoming students. We offer an art school specific full tuition scholarship to two studio and one art history majors each year. So we advise all students get their materials in by January to see if you um, are qualified to take advantage of this really great opportunity. These are some works from past um, scholarship recipients. So during your application process this fall, there's a lot of fun opportunities to stay in contact with us. We're offering modified studio tours of our facilities, one-on-one -on -one portfolio review appointments, or even if you just want some feedback on where you're at with your portfolio. And we have some fun interactive virtual events um, coming up in this event that you're at right now too. <laughs> and National Portfolio Day is really great. These are all the events through National Portfolio Day we'll be at. They're free to attend and we can't recommend it more. Visit the National Portfolio Day website to register and learn more information. So we really hope to see you there and everywhere and on campus next fall. And I'm going to turn over my screen and mic to Tatiana Potts. If I can find the stop button. So shall I go ahead? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. So my name is Tatiana Potts and uh, I am a professor um, in the department of printmaking and book arts. Uh, Pre-making encompasses uh, we teaching there uh, the different techniques. For example, we work with metal like copper plates. That would be class called etching. Or we can do what you might be familiar with, uh, such as relief printing. 
that involves using the um, wood or linoleum. You might be familiar with that from high school. Then we also do lithography, which uses the stone. So it be something that you uh, might have not uh, experienced. Um, then also letterpress. We have wonderful uh, several presses that you can print your type and then include that kind of text and create a three-dimensional object search books. So we do have a book art classes. We have um, practically two sessions. One is an introduction when you learn different structures and the second um, version, a second continuum to the book arts uh, relates to um, involving and including the text and it's under the junior senior classes that you have opportunity to, to learn more, which would also include more other structures. I did uh, prepare some kind of um, a small demo or show you a simple book, but also examples of the pieces. And I'm gonna switch my camera so you can actually see my desk and on my face. Um, so give me a second right here. So we flip this over. Um, so you can see now my table over here that I prepared little mini uh, shelf from the minis. So usually what we do in our book class is in order to learn how to do the structures, we practice it in different sizes. So we start with the tiny ones or with the larger ones and then the final. So you test out the problem and figure it out what might happen. So the examples of some of them that it's a large one and sometimes more complicated as you see, it doesn't necessarily fit in the screen, but also different challenges. So this one opens like a kaleidoscope. It, is, it has magnetic closure and it has some kind of revealing, um, uh, revealing content inside it. What I wanna point out with that is that it doesn't necessarily mean that the book has to have a text, right? For this one, we often challenge, I challenge my students to create a different shapes. How can you actually challenge the structure of the book? This one sort of opens like a um, um, puzzle, keeps going on and on, and you have a different folds, the folds in the back, and just have a different reveal of what's happening and how you're closing it up. So you can't completely can create your own structures. Here's another example. And again, notice on these little structures, it's very tiny, um, which is great is because you can figure it out the mistake. You can figure it out what you need to do to fix. Why is not working, right? So this one is, seems like it's keep going on. I added some magnets there so you can um, attach it right here and have a little dimensional piece. Again, this one is all done with the scraps and really testing out what works, what doesn't. Believe me, things doesn't always work out, like in this book. I was really challenged of like, was interesting in different shapes and wanted to fold a different way. But in this case, you can see that I didn't account for enough space, so it doesn't really close. So there you go. But what happens next is that when you do it bigger, you know what to do, right? You're gonna account for the space. And that's why it's excellent to start with the tiny ones. So as I showed you in this example, we will make a little bouquet so we can actually hold all your little samples and also experiment. What I also wanted to point out, like in this example, um, because of pandemic, we often didn't have access to nice uh, material. I was using a lot of recycled material. So this is basically cut out the catalog from jewelry, or I believe that was a Jerry Rama, some advertising in there. So I created this box out of literally that paper, everything recycled, and then inserted a tiny little book that was actually drawn and not printed. And again, challenged myself with different shape. Um, the other example of what uh, from this library that I want to show you is a little more complicated book that has more layers. So it opens up like a star. As you can see, that has several layers. So each paper is shorter, shorter as it comes forward. Um, but it creates a different kind of dimension and three dimensionality. Again, your choice of how you decorate it, what kind of uh, thread you use, or the covers to complement the entire narrative of the books you're gonna experience. Because it's important to consider this one is tiny object, right? So uh, how you're gonna interact with it, how the viewer is gonna interact it. So it's really more intimate. We do some sewing, 
serving structures that you can see. And again, in these little ones, you can see a lot of recycled material, whatever I have around me. Um, here is another one that you can see from my library. This is old prints that I used and that they're just scraps. But it seems like once you cut any tiny pieces, they bring a new life to it. So even though it felt like you want to throw it away, but believe me, save every little scrap that you can think of. Uh, favorite book that is right here is what I want to show you. And then what usually people say, oh my God, I want to make a real book. So what is the real book? Just because it looks like a textbook, is that the real book? You know, it is, of course, you're gonna see it like a real book, but again, in this one, I cut out the various prints, so you still see just trims of leftovers or proofs, but it becomes really a different object. Now, this one is an example of the, the reason why I have the prints is because we will be working on a printing project when we will create a composition and then we will select the theme and we will swap the print so each of you let's say print 12 enough for each other we swap the prints and then glue them together and put them together and i will have a collection of everybody's prints tie in one book so i do have a real book right but it's full of other people's work so it's really good way to exchange um, concretely, like at the moment, we're working with the group that I'm teaching class right now on this book that are called accordion books, very simple books, but again, bounded, nicely folded in a hardcover. So again, it is sort of like a look of real book. But again, challenge of making it a little different than anybody else. Of course, you can add some writing or whatever other leftover things you have. But jumping forward, uh, what I wanted to show you is this is what I'm going to show you how to make. So as you see in this example, again, this is just my leftover print, some proof that I cut out. When you open it, you can see a little division right here, and it has two sections of the paper, which are known as signature, and they are both sewn together. So you can see the stitch on inside, but it's actually white, so it's hard to see. Um, but it's basically just folded, very simple. You can use even such simple things like a cereal box or some whatever box that you have available that you are able to fold. So as you see, very handy, small, you can put it in your bag, carry around and make your sketches every day or fill it up with the notes that you want to do for the next projects. So what I did here, I prepared the paper so we can save the time. So here's again, I have some leftover paper right here that I had the print. I conveniently already cut it to the side so we don't have to go through that. Um, so here's the paper that I had leftover print and I discarded that it just it wasn't working. So what I did was um, cut it as a long rectangle and folded and made a little mountain in the center as you see right here. So basically what I measured the width of my paper right here see how it will fold right here, created a spine, and then fold it again. So I have a little peak behind here. If you're familiar with origami, you know this one is called valley and this one is called mountain, right? So we, we want little mountain and then we want another valley right here so we can nest two sections right here. Now here's would be a puzzle how we sew it together and I said I did it together, right? So it's not only two separate pieces, but all in one shot. Um, this kind of style is called double pamphlet stitch, and this is how I'll show you how we will sew it. So in order to know where to poke the holes in these, I already prepared the paper, so we already have the paper, and I do have the, again, cut out uh, leftover proofs of the prints that I discarded. Um, I'm going to make a template how to uh, make the holes. The point of this whole thing is that we need to make sure that the holes, once we punch them, they match, right? So when you're sewing, they're all even and nicely organized. So what I did was I cut the uh, my template. It's a, like a regular piece of paper, just whatever scrap you have. The height of the paper or your book that you're going to use. So you see how I'm comparing right here. Now tell you the uh, tell you the secret. I don't like to measure, so I always like to find the way how I can just avoid that. So I need three holes. So here is here is the first one. Very easy. Fold it in half, right? We find the center. If you are that person who likes precision, totally use the ruler. So here's my first mark for the center. 
Now I'm gonna use another two I need on the top. So again, I just estimate. So I fold this one this way and the other one kind of match it very close to each other. So now I have another two holes. You just wanna make sure that it's not too close to the edge and not too far, right? So your book is not flimsy. So as I open it up, now you have a three holes right here. It's hard to see, and believe me, when you punch more, you're not gonna be sure where exactly the cross is. So it always helps to just enforce that with the pencil and just make those markings so you actually see those three points. For simplicity, because we're gonna be punching two section of paper and the cover, that's three, it's important that you mark your um, template where is the top with the T, so you always turn it the right side because as, you, as I show you, I didn't measure. So there is a chance that this hole is gonna be a little higher than the other, so you don't wanna turn it upside down and punch it wrong way. So here is my first signature. Um, I open it up like this, don't lay it flat. Uh, put my, now again, I want this to be T. Now, if you do have text, very important that you do the same orientation, right? Don't sew it upside down. It does happen. So sometimes it helps that you also put the pencil in and say, this is my T. So when I'm sewing more, I'm reminded which way to turn it around. So I will place my template inside and then grab a special tool that it's called OWL. So it's basically a pointy little puncher tool. It's very handy to punch the hole. As you see, I aligned the template on the top, so it's really snug. And then I will hold this in my palm as a little mushroom and push down 90 degrees down so you can punch it through. This paper is pretty soft, so you don't have to push very crazy. Um, but it's gonna work. The, the idea, the goal is that you stay exactly on the line in the gut of it. So I'll repeat and do it for the same one. Again, make sure that your T marks uh, match. So what do you want for the top that it match with your template? Now you kind of have, can sense it and I'm kind of feeling when I punched it. So if I miss the little dotted place that I marked, that I know that I'm exactly on that point in that hole. Now, you might be puzzled what I do with this cover, right? I have two sections and I have the little mountain, so what I'm gonna do. So what you do, you're gonna treat it the same way as a signature, you're gonna punch it, fold it over, and pretend that this is just short side of the paper and this is longer. So punch it exactly the same way, all together. So if I'm considering this is gonna be my top, so then I'm gonna match it with my T again, um, add it in here and then hold it up like a cradle and again sends where that hole punch through the paper and punch my cover. Now and this one might be a little harder because it's black but they are the holes. So open it up and this is how we sew it together. So we have holes, we use the template. So I'm gonna use this one and sew it on the right. This one I'm gonna sew it on the left. So I'm gonna grab the needle that I already conveniently have it threaded. <laughs> I'm gonna use green, so you hopefully you'll see more of it, at least in the center. Um, the thread is usually waxed, so it's a little stiffer, which is very good because as you notice, I really don't do really careful holding, the needle is not gonna fall out, so that's really convenient. Um, so no tying the knot around to be worried about that kind of issue. Also, the thread is very strong, so it doesn't frail. And also it's important, it doesn't twist on you. If you ever embroider, that kind of sometimes might drive you nuts. How those knots always happen, this is not gonna happen. So that's, and it's sturdy and it's still archival. Usually it's waxed with beeswax. So when you start to uh, sew, you still don't do a knot. You just start without it. So the trick is how to sew this all together. So you hold this. I'm gonna push my computer a little farther away. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna hold it. So I'm opening up this side. I'm opening up this side in the center, right? When we're gonna sew it, uh, squish it together with our cover, lift it up and just sew it all together. When we start, we start in the center. So we have the center hole. Now it might go a little um, harder because we have three sections to go through. So we can actually see and you can go one by one when you're starting. So I'm gonna go through my first signature, 
the big gathering. Then I go through my covers, you can see right here, and then I'm going through the second one. So as you see, I made it through. Pull on it or wiggle a little bit if you don't feel like that the hole is very big. Now what I'm going to do at the end, I either hold it with my thumb or you can just use masking tape and tape it lightly so it doesn't go away, right? But leave the tail there, you will need it for tying it later. So once you're holding it, flip it over and then choose which one you want to go. You can go either top or bottom, doesn't really matter the order. You just want to um, make a stitch. So we'll close over here. These corners might happen. So as you see that I have the first stitch, turn it over again and we're going to go in the center again. So this time I will flip this tail on the side so I don't puncture it through. You don't want to go it through the thread. You want to go it next to it. So I'll finish that one up. As you see, I have the first stitch. Now I turn it and I have first stitch as well. So I'm just going to finish up. Now, because you saw that already, then it's easier to hold it now. It's not as, um, this one is little. There you go. So we have these ones. Now we have to finish up this one on the other side. So we poke through that one as well. And that one's been sewn twice already. So it's a little bigger and easier. So as we fix it up the corners. So now the problem is we need to tie it together, but we have the tail on the opposite side, right? So in order to bring it back, we need to go back in the center, but we just came from there. So if you just go and punch through it, you unravel what you just did. So in order to prevent that, what you're gonna do, you're gonna create a, what's known as a kettle stitch. You put the needle under right here, kind of loop it around under and under. So you, you make a little loop is I can slowly show you right here. So you tug your little thread around it, loop it around and then go back in the center. So this way, you know, it's not gonna unravel. There, so you have a nice finishing tag right here, but you also met with your tail right here. So at this point, all you do is do a um, square knot, it's called square knot, that's the same that you put, um, make a knot on your tennis shoes lace, shoelaces. And typically in a small book, just um, cross stitching, cross knotting it twice. That's plenty, you don't have to do more. It's gonna hold. Remember this thread is also waxed, so it's pretty strong. And then just trim the axis off. Don't go too close in case it's unravel, you can fix it. So that's all sewn and you have it nicely sewn. So what you do, just you just close your book so he was the first signature, right? Here's our cover. Here's the other cover and here's the other signature right here, right? So see, it's a little, um, it's a little thick. So what I do is I'll take this tool, it's called bone folder that you can compress it a little bit. So it's lace flat, the paper do what, what you want it to do. And you have your nice book that you have the beginning of the one side of the signature, then you have that division, and then you have the other part right here, and you're ready to put it in your notebook and carry it around everywhere with you and write the notes and make a little sketches. So that will be all. Thank you, Tatiana, that was amazing. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to turn the screen over to Z Ona with Art History. Okay, let me share my screen. I just want to um, thank you all for coming and to uh, tell you a little bit about, are you, uh, let's see what I've got here. Let me share my screen. This is sharing my Zoom. So let me quickly just switch over to my PowerPoint and get that started. Working? Yes, looks good. Okay, terrific. So um, I just want to say hello, hi, uh, welcome, um, introduce myself. My name is Z, uh, and I am the chair of the art history department in the Hartford Art School. Uh, we are a department of three full-time faculty and a whole bunch of additional faculty who come in to teach in their areas of expertise. Um, and what we do uh, is sort of um, uh, both assist in teaching classes for Hartford Art School studio students, and we also offer 
a major and a minor in the discipline of art history itself. So, uh, and we, we find that a lot of students actually, when they have the opportunity to take some art history, uh, will actually decide, oh yeah, I'm really kind of excited about this, and they decide to minor. We have tons and tons of people who are doing studio majors who also minor in art history. Uh, and then we also have a bunch of students who are, uh, as um, Rebecca talked about earlier, double majoring. So uh, right at the moment, I think we have three uh, ceramics majors who are also art history majors, uh, and one um, illustration major who's also an art history major, as well as you know a handful, large number of just straight art history majors. So it's really kind of cool that we are housed in the Hartford Art School and allow that kind of crossover to happen. Um, and uh, every Hartford Art School student, whether you're a studio person or an art history person, will take some art history. Um, and so we try to accommodate as many different avenues and interests as you may have. So uh, though we're relatively small, we really do have, I think, I don't want to brag, but uh, an enormous range of courses that we offer, both at the sort of introductory level and then at more advanced levels, uh, more in-depth kinds of classes. So for example, just this semester, we're teaching um, sort of the history of Western art one and two. So we start with the cave paintings and go up through Gothic cathedrals, and then we pick up with the Renaissance and go on into contemporary. Uh, but we're also um, uh, offering an introduction to the uh, history of Islamic art. And uh, what's a course that's called American Crossroads, which thinks about the uh, connections and the conflicts that occur uh, with the, um, uh, various Native American cultures and their interactions with um, colonial settlement and things like this. So it's really kind of a range, even at the introductory level, of the kinds of ideas and the material that you'll be looking at. And then at the upper level, uh, again, this semester we're offering medieval art, northern renaissance art, a history of photography, I think there's an impression of impressionism and post-impressionism class, a history of Chinese art, um, a history of women in art. So there's really a variety that I think will uh, help everybody who is taking the classes to find the thing that kind of sparks them uh, and, and give you the kind of uh, background and the knowledge that you need to, uh, to sort of make your own practice as strong as it can be. So I'm gonna see if I can move this forward. So some of the highlights of what we do uh, we, we definitely sort of focus on the sort of uh, range, as I've, I've talked about, of uh, the history of art through different cultures uh, across the world and across time. Uh, and part of what we do is just offer you the opportunity to discover that. I don't know how many of you have art history programs in your high school, or maybe art history is embedded in maybe some of the studio classes that you take or maybe you just love going to the museums and you're always in the museums and checking things out. Um, but this, uh, this program really helps to sort of fill in uh, your knowledge of the world through the, the, the sort of visual field. Um, and I think just to pick up on some of the things that um, were talked about in the video that, um, that uh, Rebecca showed at the very beginning, uh, I, I also wanna stress, you know, one of the things that Catherine Opie said in that video is that uh, you really need to be, become more adept at decoding our visual world and thinking uh, carefully about what you see, developing that observational acuity and the kind of attentiveness uh, to the world around you, both its artistic forms, the way that the world is designed, uh, in order to develop critical thinking, to really be able to, to, to sort of put the parts together and make sense of the world more broadly. Uh, and that we do in the art history program primarily through uh, writing uh, and through uh, research and those kinds of projects. But they come to bear, I think, also in your studio classes as well. There's a bunch of times when students have said, you know, well, I've learned about this thing in art history and look, I'm doing this other thing in my painting class. And it's really interesting how the two things are coming together. So we really think of that as a kind of synergistic opportunity to help you uh, get the kinds of skills you need, the visual skills and the historical knowledge uh, to put that into uh, to good use and to good practice. We do a lot of teamwork uh, in the classroom, a lot of sort of um, uh, group research and presentations. We also really um, emphasize getting out in the world when that's possible. So we have a lot of opportunities for internships uh, in some of our local um, 
uh, institutions as well as on campus. And as Rebecca mentioned, also uh, some of your history students have gone down to Miami for Art Basel and things like this. So there's lots of opportunities to kind of put your skills to work. Um, we also really uh, encourage study abroad. So a number of our students have studied in Spain and in Italy in Australia, we have, I think somebody went to Japan at one point. So the, the, the opportunities are really uh, pretty extensive and that's very exciting too, to be able to sort of use what you've used here, learned here on campus and in Connecticut and then apply it to the broader world out there. Uh, so we, we sort of try to facilitate all of that as much as possible. Uh, and I thought, you know, uh, since everybody who comes to the Hartford Art School will be taking some art history, and some of you might get so excited that you take a lot of art history, you might end up even majoring in art history. Uh, I wanted to just give you a sample maybe of, of, of one of the projects that I'm doing now in one of my survey classes because uh, it's, the kind of, it's the kind of course that you might start with. This is a history of Western art one. Uh, and we've been looking at um, some of the works from the ancient world. So, uh, we have here uh, a, what's called a stele on the left of Naramson, who is a great warrior king. And then on the other side, we have a seated pharaoh, Khafre, from ancient Egypt. Uh, and these are, are sort of two very different monuments that give us a sense when you start to unpack their visual forms and their formal language of the ways in which a culture expresses its values through visual forms. Uh, and there are a lot of similarities, but there's also some very distinct differences between the kind of more military might and physical strength that we see uh, in Naramson on the left here compared to the relatively calm and stoic and eternal kind of figure that we see with Khafre on the right. Uh, and so we've spent some time really sort of unpacking these figures and thinking about not only the way that they're presented, but also some of the symbolism that's embedded in the images. And then I said, okay, so go out uh, and think about your world and where you see monuments or images that uh, represent maybe the values that we have come to sort of try to hold uh, up in our own culture. Uh, so all of the students went out and uh, thought about which monuments they sort of think of when they think of the United States. So we got some examples like the Lincoln Memorial, the Statue of Liberty, and really thought about what kind of images are being used here and what the values are, what the, the sort of concerns are that are embodied in these figures. And then the final step was, okay, so you are on the Monuments Commission and what would you make right now as a monument of our times? Like, what do you think is the kind of thing that uh, needs to be brought to the attention of the wider uh, public and how would you represent it? Uh, and every student then went and uh, talked to, amongst each other and came up with some rough sketches, uh, some cases more finished than others, of the kinds of, of monuments that they think really speak to the concerns that we're facing right now. So on the left, uh, there was this is one example of about five of the monuments that people came up with to honor uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, and her at the moment of her passing. And we thought about location, we thought about materials, we thought about um, uh, how scale, how large, uh, the specific siting. Um, so in this case, a lot of people said, well, it should be right there at the Supreme Court. It should really be sort of a, 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 meth a method of presenting her as continuing on in the same way that that Pharaoh Khafre looks like he's kind of continuing on. Uh, and, and so that her legacy can continue. And then on the right, this is one of a number of, of uh, sketches that students came up with to think about honoring um, emergency responders uh, and uh, healthcare workers. This is a doctor. You may, may be able to make out a little stethoscope around uh, the, the neck here. Uh, reaching down from the pedestal to the people. And this is a kind of another way we thought about gesture and body language and posture and the kinds of values that that perhaps can convey. So this is just a, a kind of um, introductory assignment that gets, I think my hope is that it gets uh, the students in the class to sort of make connections between the ancient past, which might feel like, oh my God, that's 5,000 years ago, how can that possibly be relevant? Uh, and then what's going on right now with us and how we might put some of that visual knowledge to work in thinking about our own contemporary circumstances and the things that we want to highlight today. So uh, 
as I said, all students will take some art history, uh, and uh, I think uh, Art 210, this, the class where we're doing this particular project, is one of the um, sort of beginner classes. Uh, and if you end up deciding that art history is sort of really your thing, you'll end up taking a whole bunch of classes, both at the introductory level, the survey level, and then the more advanced level. Um, and a lot of times people wonder, so, okay, so what do I do then if I graduate with an art history degree? What does that, uh, what opportunities does that uh, afford me? Um, and I think what's really interesting is that uh, it uh, really is uh, an opportunity to do a lot of different things. So there Thanks. are a lot of, yeah. I'd interrupt your screen's a little cut off on the top. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you should, I'm sorry to interrupt what you're saying. Could you try exiting out of the screen share and starting it again? That might help. Yeah, and I can also, um, if it would help, I can also not put it on presentation mode. You can see if this works better. No, it's still, it's, it's like zoomed in a little bit, but it's cutting off your chart. I have this weird green box in the middle of my screen, which I also don't understand, but um, uh, okay, let's see. So when I'm in it, there is, can you see that better? Okay. Better. Okay. <laughs> so um, does that work? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So no, the, I think the green box is what is telling me what you're seeing. Ah, okay. <laughs> Living and learning with technology, I'm telling you, it's been, it's been a wondrous week. Um, so uh, when we're thinking about what our history opens up, uh, there are sort of uh, traditional careers, there are uh, jobs in museums, curatorial and conservation jobs. I have a, a couple of students right now who are interested in going into conservation. So they are taking advantage of the fact that we have a fabulous chemistry department right across campus and doing a lot of chemistry in preparation for going into conservation work. Um, there's also a variety of different sort of educational jobs uh, and library and archival jobs that are uh, really within the wheelhouse of somebody with an art history background. But there's also a bunch of um, what you might call sort of non-traditional careers, uh, people who work um, in, uh, on Wall Street, in fact, uh, or, or in medical fields who have put their art history knowledge and the sort of visual acuity that I was talking about uh, to work uh, to, to think about different kinds of visual information. It might not necessarily always be uh, works of art that they're, that they're dealing with. Um, but then there are also very hands-on jobs like art installers, um, uh, people who deal with lending and moving art from place to place and bringing it from shows uh, in London to New York to Los Angeles or all these kinds of things. Uh, there are people who work in the legal field uh, related to the history of art. Um, I had a friend actually in graduate school who went on to work for uh, the restitution projects of uh, work that had been uh, looted by the Nazis and was getting returned to families across the world. So there's a lot of ways in which this is knowledge that can really be put to work in a variety of different ways, depending on what your, uh, your own goals may be, your career goals. We have a couple of students who have gone on to, um, to work in more traditional fields like museums. Uh, this is uh, a couple of shots of one of our majors from quite a while ago who got a BA in art history, Shanta Scott, uh, who now works in the Studio Museum in the Education Department and Family and Youth Programs uh, in New York City, which really does a lot of fantastic community outreach uh, and educational programming. The, another more recent graduate, Rebecca Chozik, who was actually a double major in printmaking and in art history, uh, who um, has worked in a number of different galleries in New York and internationally at this point, uh, who has uh, sort of worked her way up to uh, a really sort of um, um, high ranking position in a, at a gallery in New York as a director. Um, and she's been in contact with us and said, you know, this, the stuff that we do in the art history classes has really been key to helping me get my feet in the door in this gallery world and then to really sort of uh, leverage that to um, more and more exciting positions. So I think the opportunities are really kind of um, exciting, uh, especially when combined with the tremendous opportunities within the larger Hartford Art School to experiment with uh, the studio, the really great range of studio majors that are there as well as across campus with all of the opportunities that you have in the, the, the sort of um, broad liberal arts, the sciences, 
uh, engineering, music, all of those things are there at your fingertips at the University of Hartford, which makes, makes it possible to make some really exciting combinations. So I will actually leave it at that. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk more about anything on part of that presentation. Thank you so much, Z. If anyone has any questions about anything we've covered, or if you have questions or would like us to talk about something we haven't discussed yet today, please put it in the Q&A and we will gladly answer that live for you. And I will also enable you to unmute yourself. So if you'd like to ask us a live question too, we're more than happy to have a discussion. So any questions, you know, even about the application process, majors, art history, bookmaking, or maybe something you saw from another session during open house that you attended that you'd like um, to further discuss. I have a, I have a small suggestion. Sure. Is it all right if we go back to the portfolio slides of like what's required and what isn't? Yeah, absolutely. Let me pull that up. Okay. So this is our, these are our portfolio requirements for admission. Is there something specific that you would like to discuss about the portfolio? Uh, are we allowed to showcase like sketches in our progress with like our photos and whatnot or like our drawings? Of course, of course. And especially with the portfolio reviews being primarily online right now, if the progress and process of how you made something is important to the work where we would love to see those steps and images alongside the finished products. All right. That's kind of like the question I had mainly focused on. Awesome. Great. That's a great question. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.